One of the key principles of mathematics is to take complicated, difficult subjects and try to turn them into workable, tractable subjects. That's going to be part of the beauty of torque varieties. Underlying the theory of torque varieties is the language of convex geometry. So let's set that up. Now, as usual, okay, we have our torus T sub n. So now, capital N is going to come into play. We'll let m be the character lattice of T sub n. So recall, these are just maps in the C star that are morphisms and homomorphisms. Capital N is going to be the lattice of one parameter subgroups. So these are going to be morphisms and homomorphisms that go in the other direction. So from C star into T sub n. Concretely, if T sub n is equal to C star at the n, okay, we can think of n as just being z to the n. Then, okay, these are just going to be tuples. So I have u equal to b1 through bn. They're all integers. And then for the one parameter subgroup, we take our T in C star and just raise to the appropriate power in each slot. Now, we'll leave this as an exercise. Okay, abstractly, how do we think of or torus in terms of the one parameter subgroups. Well, to do that, I have n as a group under addition, c star as a group under multiplication. We take the tensor over the integers, and the map is given by u tensor t goes to one parameter subgroup for u applied to t. So I'll leave that for you to sort out. Now, M and N admit a non-degenerate bilinear pairing. So how does this work? If I have a one-parameter subgroup and a character, we can compose. So the one-parameter subgroup goes from C star to TN. The character goes from TN to C star. And so we get a map from C star to C star. That's a homomorphism and a morphism. And we've seen that that only happens when we raise to powers. So we're just going to take the power, and that's going to be how we define the pairing. Concretely, if T sub n is equal to C star to the n, okay, we'll pick our character given by the tuple m equal to a1 through an. Then, okay, our pairing is just given by the usual dot products between tuples. We want to take our lattices m and n, extend the real vector spaces, and we're going to also extend the pairing. So we'll indicate these vector spaces by m sub r and n sub r. For convex geometry, when dealing with affine torque varieties, we use convex polyhedral cones. And we'll usually drop the convex when we talk about these. So we'll take a finite subset S in the vector space n sub r. The cone of S, which we'll denote by sigma, is just a set of all linear combinations over the elements of S with entries real and greater than or equal to zero. Then this is a subset of n sub r. We'll say that sigma is generated by s. And for further definitions, if s is a subset of the lattice n, we'll call sigma rational. And if sigma contains no non-zero subspaces, so there are no lines in sigma, then sigma is called strongly convex. Other ways to characterize strongly convex First, sigma intersect minus sigma is zero. Next, sigma has zero as an apex or vertex. Finally, zero is a face of sigma. We'll talk about faces in a little bit. For some low dimensional examples, okay, let's start in dimension one. So I'll have n equal to z. I'll let s be equal to one. The cone generated over s is just gonna be the ray past zero. This is rational because one is an integer and it's strongly convex, okay, it contains no lines, or zero is a vertex. If we take s equal to plus or minus one, the cone generated over s is the entire real line. This is still rational, but now it's not strongly convex. Okay? It contains a line, or zero is not a vertex now. Finally, okay, and then we'll have more examples later on, I'll let n be equal to z2, let s be equal to plus or minus e1, e2. Okay, so this will give the upper half plane. This is rational, but it's not strongly convex because it contains the x-axis. Or zero is not a vertex. 
One thing we need to keep clear, when do we work in M, when do we work in N? M is the character lattice, so there we expect to find function theoretic data. N, the lattice of one parameter subgroups, is where we expect to find geometric data. Now, we want to be able to pass between the two, so we need some definitions. If we have sigma, okay, a cone and n sub r, we'll define the dual cone, sigma check, and m sub r, okay, on the other side, as follows. So if we had m sub r and n sub r as the same vector space, then we're just taking all m, okay, what would we do? We consider all vectors u in our cone, and m has to be within 90 degrees of all of those vectors. Okay, note we have a corresponding definition for cones and m sub r. Now some things we need to check, Okay, sigma check is a polyhedral cone in M sub R, okay, if sigma is, and if we check twice, we get back the original cone. To analyze things a little bit further, okay, if we have M, non-zero, and M sub R, I can define hyperplanes and half spaces. So H sub M is just going to be the set of all U and N sub R, such that if we pair with M, we get zero. And for the half space, we're going to have the same definition, except when we pair, we have greater than or equal to zero. Okay, we'll look at pictures in a little bit to make this clearer. Now, with that, we have the half space presentation of our cone sigma and n sub r. So what we'll do is, okay, we're going to take the dual of sigma, sigma check. That'll be finally generated by some m1 through ms, okay, in m sub r. Then, something you need to show is that you can write sigma as the intersection of the half spaces that go at the ends. Also, we could talk about faces of our cone sigma. So our faces, okay, we'll denote these by tau, are just going to be given by taking sigma intersecting with the hyperplanes. Okay, we'll count sigma as a face of itself, and we'll have a partial ordering, okay, just given by inclusion of faces. And then there's a lot of details we need to check here. Now, for examples, okay, let's start with a two-dimensional example. So let's suppose, okay, I'm going to start with finite set, okay, E1, E1 plus E2 inside of M. So here we have M sub R. Since we're working in M, that's going to be sigma check. So when we go to N, we're going to get sigma itself. Okay, and that's going to look like this space here. Okay, so you have your E1 goes in that direction, E1 plus E2 in that direction. If we take the dual, we're going to get this polyhedral cone here. Now, how do we get this? So what I'll do is I take E1. Okay, we're going to take E1. That's going to point in a direction. We're going to take the line that's perpendicular through the origin, and then we're going to shade in the region that goes in the direction we're pointing in. So that's going to be the half space for E1. Likewise, the half space for E1 plus E2. Okay, we're going to point in the direction E1 plus E2, draw in the perpendicular line through the origin, and then shade in the region that we point in the direction of. And then we intersect. And so that's going to be okay, our sigma, the dual of sigma check in this example here. Let's consider three-dimensional examples. So if I take m equal to z3, we consider the cone generated by e1, e2, e3, and e1 plus e2 minus e3. If you think of the characters that go with these, okay, we're just considering the affine torque variety y sub a generated by the ideal xy minus zw. So we've seen this one before. Now for the picture in m sub r, okay, we'll call this sigma check, so E1, E2, E3, and E1 plus E2 minus E3. So that's a general shape of our polyhedral cone. Now if we dualize, okay, we're going to go over to N sub R, okay, we're going to get polyhedral cone that looks like this, okay, sigma, and that's generated by E1, E2, E1 plus E3, E2 plus E3. You might be wondering, what's the work that we need to do to go between these? So let's suppose we go from sigma to sigma check. Now, I start with each of the generators, okay, we find the corresponding hyperplanes, and then we just have to fill in according to which way our generating vectors point. So for instance, if I took E1, okay, its perp is going to be, okay, this plane in the back spanned by E2 and E3. For E2, okay, 
okay, pointing this way, its perp is going to be this plane here, spanned by E1 and E3, and so on for the other two. Okay, so these are easy to calculate. So now all I need to do is fill in according to how the original vectors point. Okay, and so that's going to give us our polyhedral cone over here. Now, another example is still m equal to z3, but now let's take the cone generated by e1 and e2. So this is going to be a two-dimensional polyhedral cone sitting in three space. Note, this is strongly convex, but if we dualize, we get something that's not strongly convex. Okay, so here, if we take the hyperplanes corresponding to e1 and e2, okay, we're just getting, okay, here it's the yz plane, here it's the xz plane, we fill in according to the way the vectors point, and we're just getting this quadrant that points out to the front. Okay, so you'll note we have a line contained in this cone, so not strongly convex. Okay, just a note, okay, the proposition that goes with this, if you have sigma, a fully dimensional polyhedral cone, okay, so that means sigma takes up, okay, the same dimension as the space that it lives in, then we'll have sigma strongly convex if and only if sigma check is strongly convex. Okay, so we note that's not happening right here. With the machinery of cones, we have an alternative to viewpoint four for affine toric varieties. So instead of starting with a collection of generators for an affine semigroup, we instead start with a rational polyhedral cone. We intersect with the character lattice, and that gives us an affine semigroup to get our affine toric variety. Now, this is more restrictive, but it'll be better for the big picture when we do projective toric varieties. Here's the theorem. We'll have sigma, rational polyhedral cone, and n sub r. Okay, so we're going to start on the geometry side. What we're going to do, we're going to take the dual, which will put us on the character side. Okay, s sub sigma, we'll define as sigma check intersect n. So it's going to be a semigroup in the character lattice. I just take spec over the algebra to get an affine toric variety. So we'll define u sub sigma to be spec of the algebra for s sub sigma, and that's an affine toric variety, okay, just using what we had from before. Now the following are equivalent. We have sigma strongly convex. Dimension of u sub sigma equals n is equivalent to the torus for u sub sigma is the tensor product of n with c star over the integers. We noted this before. Let's run this through some examples. Okay, so our main example okay, is gonna be strongly convex, but of lower dimension. So what we have, we'll have, okay, sigma is gonna be a product of m half lines, and the remaining n coordinates are gonna be zero. So definitely of lower dimension. This is inside of n sub r, so on the geometry side. If we take the dual, we're still going to have product of m half lines, but now product with r sub n. That's inside the character vector space. Okay, so that's sigma check. Now the generator for this cone, okay, generator is going to be e1 through e sub m, plus minus e sub m plus 1, up through plus minus e sub m plus n. If we match these to the characters, okay, we get the coordinate ring. Coordinate ring is just going to be polynomial ring generated by T1 through Tm. T sub n plus 1 plus minus 1 up through T sub n plus n plus minus 1. So we already know the space that goes with this is going to be Y sub a equal to C to the m cross C star to the n. Note, okay, we have strongly convex, and this is fully dimensional. Okay. Take a special case of this, just so we could draw some pictures. Okay, let me start first with this ray inside of R2. So this is strongly convex. This is our sigma inside of N sub R. We take the dual. We get the half plane. This is generated by E1 plus minus E2. And that gives us a C cross, a C star. If we run this backwards, so I'll we'll start with sigma equal to the half plane. Okay, that's not strongly convex. We take the dual, we get the half line, okay, inside of M sub R. That's going to be generated by just E1, okay, and that's going to give us our affine torque variety equal to just the complex numbers sitting inside of C2. So this is going to be strictly lower dimensional. 
Okay, and that agrees with our theorem.